And the next item of business is a debate on motion 3625 in the name of Keith Brown on a person-centred trauma-informed public health approach to substance use in the justice system. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now or to enter R in the chat function. And I call on Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and to move the motion around 11 minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. In January, we marked the first year of the national mission to reduce drug-related deaths and harms. The groundwork has been laid, addressing the issues head-on across government in health, justice, housing and education, and putting in place the investment and actions so that we can focus on delivering change on the ground. And this change is urgently needed. Every drug-related death is a tragedy, and we are again reminded of the need for continued and collective action by the quarterly suspected drug death statistics published just yesterday. And sadly, we know that many people in the justice system, whether at the point of arrest, in the community or in custody, have drug or alcohol issues. So I welcome the opportunity today to reflect on the steps this Scottish Government and its partners are taking across the justice system and the steps we have already taken to reduce drug-related deaths and harms and how these will be built upon in the future. These form part of the person-centred and trauma-informed approach which underpins our vision for justice and will be central to how we work with people in contact with the justice system, including people with drugs or alcohol problems. It is a bold, transformative vision of the future justice system for Scotland, which sets out clear aims and priorities, including a focus on rehabilitation and shifting the balance between the use of custody and justice in the community. And I want to be clear that this approach is not the easy option to take, but it is the right option. The Scottish Government is committed to focusing on what works, what evidence demonstrates, uh, demonstrates makes a meaningful and lasting change. This is not about soft justice. This is about what is most effective. It's about what works to make communities safer and reduces victimisation and harm. It's not about building more prisons, putting more people in them and hoping for the best. That would be soft justice and the easy option. A person-centred and trauma-informed approach begins with the recognition of the need to treat everyone with respect, regardless of their background, providing support to empower people to make positive changes in their lives. And it's clear that 50 years of outdated drug legislation which focuses on criminalising people with complex needs, rather than on how services can support them into recovery, has caused more harm than good. We have known for years that police cannot simply arrest their way out of the current drugs emergency in Scotland. Many different groups of experts have looked at the Misuse of Drugs Act and concluded that change is needed. Across both Scottish Government and the Drug Death Task Force, work is underway intended to change the way we work within the current law, and I appreciate the work done by the task force to date on this. An action plan has been developed to respond to the proposals on the Phase 1 report and how to take forward a second phase of drug law reform consultation and to lead a national conversation in Scotland to show that the evidence is clear and that it is time to act. Ultimately, we believe that the best way to reduce drug-related crime and the associated harms is to provide opportunities to access appropriate treatment and support services at every point of the criminal justice system. And this is what this Scottish Government and Justice Partners are actively working towards. An excellent example of the positive steps taken to date include recorded police warnings. Last year, the Lord Advocate, and I should emphasise, the Lord Advocate is not the SNP Government. She is not uh, speaking on behalf of the Government when she acts in this area. She is independent, and she announced that the recorded police warnings may be used for all classes of drug possession. Whilst this was a decision for the Lord Advocate, I welcome this change, which can help towards a shift to a public health approach. There are other encouraging examples of effective practice. The Drug Desk Task Force has developed a police referral peer navigator programme, which is offering person-centred support to people who use drugs at the first point of contact with the police, facilitating entry to wider services and the help they need. And I very much welcome the leadership and progressive approach of Police Scotland in supporting this and other operational decisions which help save lives. For example, the recent decision by the Chief Constable to roll out the carriage of naloxone by all serving police officers up to the rank of inspector and the support of officers in this is helping to preserve life and to keep people safe. The rollout follows recommendations from an independent evaluation. I am delighted to be able to announce today that Drugs Policy Division in the Scottish Government will be providing funding of 463 
£1,500 to Police Scotland to allow them to kit out all these officers with this life-saving medication. Police Scotland are also playing an important role in advising on potential operational implications of establishing safe consumption facilities. As Parliament is aware, this is a sensitive but important measure to save lives within the existing legal framework. And of course, Police Scotland continue to take action against the serious organised crime groups who traffic drugs and are exploiting some of our most vulnerable individuals and communities for their own profit. So these preventative actions are helping to divert people with addiction out of the criminal justice system, where appropriate, and into treatment and support for their recovery. Yes, I will do. Brian Hooser. I'm very grateful for Keith Brown for taking the intervention. And can I, I say <clears throat> I associate myself with, with uh, uh, his, his words about taking this as a, a public health issue rather than a, a criminal justice uh, issue. But would you outline uh, perhaps any, any moves that the government are making to prevent people falling into the, uh, uh, the cl clutches of addiction in the first place, rather than waiting for them to get into addiction? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there are elements of the justice system which seek to do that, including a number of programmes, but my colleague uh, Angela Constance will outline some of the um, uh, ways in which we are seeking to do that through the Drug Death Task Force when she sums up, if that is okay for the member. I am um, happy to provide them with more information about what we do within justice, but I think more importantly, the stuff done uh, through Angela Constance it will be of interest to the members. So, where cases are prosecuted in court, it is rightly for the independent judiciary to decide the most appropriate sentence. This government is, however, committed to shifting the balance from custody to more effective community interventions where appropriate. We also know that many of those who offend have experienced poverty, disadvantage, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, and they often have health problems such as drug and alcohol dependency. And given the damaging effect uh, and impact of imprisonment, our long-term aim is to see custody reserved only for individuals who pose a risk of serious harm uh, in some uh, categories of others, whilst ensuring that effective community-based support and interventions are available where needed. This is why we are taking concerted action, including through forthcoming legislation on bail and release and support to transform community justice services. And the reason why it is smart justice is because we know that reconviction rates are lower when we take that approach. And if we have lower reconviction rates, we have fewer victims and less crime in Scotland. That should be the aim of everybody involved in this debate. I will do, yes. Um, I asked the Cabinet Secretary earlier this afternoon why he thought it was that Scotland continues to have the highest rate of people in prison in Europe and also the highest rate of people on remand. Um, a survey showed that almost half of prisoners, about 45 per cent, reported being under the influence of drugs at the time of their offence. How do we make sure that we have the kind of systematic changes that are needed to really address this issue? And how does he think this parliament holds the government to account on that issue? Do you think we need targets? Does he have a plan in terms of how we're actually going to make that system change? Cabinet Secretary. There's perhaps different elements to the answer to that question. Certainly in relation to should we have targets, it's not for me to tell Parliament to, uh, how they should hold the government to account, but the Justice Vision has a one-year delivery um, period, first of all, which has been put forward just now, which includes lots of existing, if not targets, certainly performance measurements and other interventions. We're also working on a three-year delivery target, and I think that, or, or delivery program, and I think that would be, when it's published, of course, an area that uh, members might want to quiz the government on. I'm sure they will do. In relation to her other point, I've mentioned already that Angela Constance will cover some of the things which we can do within society to try and reduce that dependency on alcoholism uh, and drug abuse. Within the justice system, though, we have to do more, whether it's in prisons or the way, in, for example, in police custody suites, we deal with people with these issues. And we are doing a number of those things, not least uh, one of the conversations that we had uh, today with uh, police and health professionals about how we deal through the navigator system uh, and also one or two uh, innovative approaches, for example, in Fraserborough. So I'm happy to provide more information on that if the member wishes. Um, but these approaches include how we best use monitoring and support to improve outcomes. There are potential developments in relation to alcohol and substance monitoring, and I'm committed to looking at options uh, focusing on what works. I'm also open, as I'm sure Angela Constance is, to working with members from across the chamber in doing so, and we would welcome the engagement that we've had to date. Uh, as part of our efforts to encourage greater use of community intervention, interventions, our programme for government makes clear we are committed to expanding community justice services, supporting diversion from prosecution, alternatives to remand to come back to the member's question, and community sentencing. 
In 2022-23, we increased annual funding by £50 million to £134 million to reflect continued investment in supporting pandemic recovery work and expansion and transformation of community justice services. When combined with investment in the National Drugs Mission, we are enabling timely and effective interventions in communities to prevent harm and to improve life chances. It will also support the delivery of the revised National Community Justice Strategy, which is currently under development. This will set out clear aims for partners with an emphasis on early intervention and encouraging a further shift away from the use of custody. Our approach is evidence-informed, and it is important we assess the impact of existing measures such as drug treatment and testing orders. DTTOs are an intensive disposal specifically targeted at individuals with entrenched problem drug use, chaotic lifestyles and a history of offending. They were introduced to combine justice and health approaches in a targeted way, and we know individuals on DTTOs can have difficulty fully complying with the requirements. So I welcome the Drug Desk Task Force consideration of DTTOs, and we intend to carry out some initial exploratory work reviewing the evidence available in relation to these and how they align with what is known about good practice in this area. It is also imperative that access to appropriate support is available to everyone serving a custodial sentence in Scotland. And the prison service is working tirelessly to eradicate unauthorised drugs in prison and is continuously adapting its security measures to prevent, detect and deter the introduction of contraband. In November, we laid legislation which allows prison officers to photocopy correspondence as another means to prevent the entry of illicit substances into prison and to reduce the availability of those substances to prisoners. That can only help to reduce the risk that these illicit substances present to those living and working in our prisons. And another key priority in prisons is mitigating against the known elevated risk of drug deaths at transition points, such as release from custody and ensuring naloxone provision and continuity of care on release. Prison officers and DWP staff continue to offer assistance to prisoners to plan for their release, whilst the Scottish Government continues to support the work of through care services, support individuals to reintegrate back into the community after the release. And that includes the excellent work done by Scotland's third sector and justice social work services across the country. country. Uh, presenting officer, the examples I have touched upon today are making a real difference, and they will continue to do so. There are, however, some, uh, just some of the steps that we have taken so far and that need to be taken. We know this is a complex issue, and it is not easy. It will require further action, further investment, and a collective will to address the challenges ahead. And whilst the approach we are taking is not the easy one, we are absolutely clear it is the right one to deliver lasting improvements. It is based on evidence of what works, and it is focused on actions which are effective in tackling drugs-related deaths and harm, and ultimately which make our communities safer. The Scottish Government will continue to take this forward at pace and welcome the opportunity to work with everyone across this chamber in doing so. Presenting officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Russell Finlay to speak to and to move Amendment 3625.1. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, one of the issues that unites this chamber is Scotland's drugs death record, which is a matter of national shame. Working as a journalist in the 1990s, before this parliament existed, I recall the shock of an annual death toll in the low hundreds. Year after year, the numbers rose ever upwards, and it is important to pause and reflect that in 2020 there were 1,339 drug deaths. Since this SNP government came to power, more than 10,000 lives have been lost. For reasons that I have never heard explained, the Scottish death rate is perhaps the highest in Europe and more than 3.5 times greater than the rest of the UK. Behind these statistics are real people and families. Each number is a lost son or daughter, brother or sister, vibrant lives cruelly cut short. It is proper that Scotland is treating the chronic drug problem as a public health emergency, and I expect we will hear more about that from my colleagues Annie Wells, Jamie Green and Sue Webber. But I have concerns about some of the language and indeed actions of the Scottish Government. I worry that ministers are embracing a public health solution, but at the expense of the robust use of criminal justice. I worry that they have become blinkered to the damage done by violent, wealthy and powerful drugs gangs. In essence, I worry that greater store has been given to wishful thinking than to an approach based on evidence and pragmatism. Presiding officer, the fact is we need to harness the resources of, uh, and expertise of both health and justice. It cannot be either or. Last month in this chamber, 
I discussed the Scottish Government's newly published The Vision for Justice document. As I said then, it reveals much about the Government's thinking, not least the blurring of lines between victims and criminals. That same mindset in which criminality can always be explained and perhaps even justified can be seen in the language of the Cabinet Secretary's motion today. The following lines stood out. The Scottish Government's long-term aim is that imprisonment should be reserved for individuals who pose a risk of serious harm. So, it seems criminals who pose mere harm should never be imprisoned. They must be deemed to pose serious harm. How, I wonder, does the Cabinet Secretary define serious harm? Does that mean only those who inflict violence on people? Or does the Cabinet Secretary believe, as I do, that drug dealers cause serious harm to our most vulnerable people and therefore should be in prison? I'm happy to give way to the Cabinet Secretary if he's willing to answer these questions. Cabinet Secretary. Happy to do so. I think it's preposterous to allege that somebody in this chamber does not think that drug dealing presents serious harm to people. Surely we can have a more elevated debate on these serious issues than that. Russell Finlay. I appreciate your clarification that serious harm does constitute drug dealing. <clears throat> what about the commonly held idea that some criminals should be sent to prison as punishment for their actions? On the basis of the, on the, basis of the above line, are we to understand that this concept is to be abandoned? And again, I'm happy to give way if an explanation is forthcoming. Cabinet Secretary. I think it would have been advisable for the member to listen to my statement because when I came to that point, I mentioned the fact that there are other categories other than those that present prisoners that present serious harm. And of course, there's got to be a role for punishment in the criminal justice system. But what we're trying to say is it's got to be trauma-informed, recognise where people are coming from when they present to the criminal justice system. That seems to me like a sensible approach. And it would be useful to hear if there are any sensible suggestions which the Conservatives can make in that area. Russell Finlay. The, the inclusion of that line um, is enough reason for my party to be unable to support the government's motion, nor indeed Labour's amendment. Now, I previously pointed out that there is no mention of organised crime in the Cabinet Secretary's vision for justice. It is a subject that former SNP Justice Secretaries at least used to talk about. And I was heartened when the UK Minister Kit Malthouse recently gave evidence to a joint committee to this Parliament. He spoke passionately about the need to give people help to beat their addictions. The same thinking motivates my party's Right to Recovery Bill, which has won support from those at the coalface of the drug crisis. But Mr Malthouse also spoke about the need for robust policing to hit the pernicious and dangerous drug gangs who amass huge fortunes from dealing in death. I share his disappointment that the SNP government rejected the opportunity to take part in Project Adder. Yes, I will. Julian Martin. Uh, the member uh, is talking about organised crime and people who are drug dealers in prison. He recognises a lot of people in prison who are, uh, have problem drug use, who are not involved in either of those things. Russell Finlay. Uh, absolutely. And our party uh, led, gave voice to prison officers over the past few months in respect of the huge volume of drugs coming into prisons via mail. And it was only by agitating and pushing that action was finally taken. Uh, I suspect... Um, the same tactic, um, so I wonder whether the rejection to take part in Adder was motivated, forgive me if I'm wrong, by the cynical strategy of always seeking to differentiate from UK policy. I suspect that same tactic may be the reason some ESSA... Okay, I think some time back. Constance. Um, the member may recall that in the previous debate in this parliament, I advised that the reason we didn't participate in Project Adder is they really just wanted to rebadge the work that we were already doing in Scotland, and that ultimately Project Adder is enforcement-led as opposed to public health-led. Uh, Mr. Finlay, I'll, I'll give you a wee bit of time back for Thank being you. generous with interventions, but I think really that probably well, should like to point focus out your mind on concluding in your course and not to hear any more interventions. Absolutely. I'd like to point out to the Minister that ADDER stands for Addiction, Disruption, Diversion, Enforcement and Recovery. So it's not just about enforcement, it's about all those elements. Um, I'm clearly running out of time here, but one of the other issues is the drugs consumption rooms. 
As my party said, we are open-minded about this, but we have yet to hear how it would work in practice. Would the mobile facilities or bricks and mortar? If it was a building, I bet they would not be in the postcodes that middle-class MSPs live in. Would addicts who lead chaotic lives be expected to book an appointment, turn up and stand in line? If mobile, would they be like post office vans serving communities? At a time when this uh, government has presided over the closure of one in eight libraries, what kind of message would this send out? Never mind, folks, we shut down your library and your sports centre, but we found the cash for a mobile heroin van. What would that say to parents seeking the best for their children living in drug scarred communities? I share the concerns expressed by Police Scotland about DCRs and the associated so called tolerance zones, and I declare an interest as I am married to a police officer. It was only uh, <coughs> conscious of the time. <laughs> Perhaps, uh, as Nicola Sturgeon has previously admitted, ministers have taken their eye off the ball in respect of drugs. And my concern is that eyes are still off the ball. Presiding officer, our amendment is grounded in reality, with the right to recovery at its heart. It recognises shortcomings recently laid bare by Audit Scotland, not least poor data, a lack of transparency and this government's cuts to addiction services. I would therefore urge members to support the amendment in my name. Sorry, Mr Vinnick, could you please move your amendment formally? I, I do, I move. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I now call on Claire Baker to speak to and move amendment 3625.2. Around six minutes, please, Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I do welcome the opportunity to open this debate for Scottish Labour. We agree that Scotland's drug death crisis and the huge scale of drug-related harm must be addressed through a public health approach, and that extends to the justice system. We support the use of policies such as the recorded police warning system, where appropriate, to divert individuals from the criminal justice system and towards support services. But in our prisons, it is vital that individuals experiencing drug-related harm are also offered appropriate treatment and support, and that we provide the personalised and trauma-informed care that they need to rebuild their lives. The implementation of the MAT standards is an important step, and they must be fully implemented in prisons as part of the public health approach. Delivery is crucial, and as we approach a year on from the introduction of MAT, what can we expect to see in terms of measurable progress? The Minister previously committed to updating Parliament, and I would like to know if we are going to see publication of relevant data on progress. So the majority of prisoners seen by drug and alcohol services are also presenting with mental health symptoms. So integration of these services is key. But I am disappointed by the Government's motion seeking to introduce constitutional politics into today's debate. The Drugs Minister, while she has a view on these powers, has focused on consensus building and building support for a change of direction. So I am disappointed that today's approach presents a barrier to consensus. The Government are also asking for support for an undefined consultation. It is not clear what its aims are, what its focus will be and if it will be independent. And I would ask, is it intended that it is led by Parliament, which would be a constructive approach? And also, I would concentrate on any consultation that takes place must not delay any action on delivery. Laser focus in this area must be on delivery. President officer, I remind the Scottish Government that all the UK comes under the Misuse of Drugs Act, yet it is Scotland that has three times the number of fatalities than England and Wales. I agree that the UK Government's approach is wrong, that to approach this crisis from a justice perspective is set up to repeat mistakes, although I do note that within the UK Government's relaunch strategy there is diversion policies, um, and the Conservatives themselves are highlighting ADAR. Uh, they may not be emphasising them, but they are there, which is another reason why I can't really understand the, con the Conservatives' rejection of this approach in Scotland through a police recorded warnings system. But the Scottish Government cannot rewrite the history of drug deaths in Scotland and suggest the responsibility lies elsewhere. Over the past 15 years, while this crisis has grown and embedded itself in too many communities and families across Scotland, we have seen the wrong response, a complacent response and a slow response. And while it was driven by the Tories and introduced by the SNP, the Parliament must take responsibility for the wrong-headed road to recovery strategy that set, in, that set back progress and harm reduction policies. But the Scottish Government must take responsibility for cuts to ADPs in 2016-17, meaning reduction in support and services. And when the drugs death figures started to rise, the Government's response was that this was generational and almost to be expected. This delayed investment, it delayed political focus and the will that was desperately needed. 
So management, mismanagement of the prison service and underfunding of key services, including mental health, cannot be swept aside. Prison numbers are still too high and staffing pressure among healthcare staff continues despite repeated warnings over the impact of overcrowding and a lack of treatment services and through care. That the period immediately following release from prison is a time of increased risk of drug-related death is well evidenced. The National Drug-Related Death Database records that more than one in ten people who had a drug-related death had been in prison in the six months prior. The Criminal Justice uh, round table, Committee Roundtable recently highlighted the lack of support prior to the release of prison for prisoners, but concerns about the adequacy of services throughout through care is not new. We acknowledge the recent announcements made by the Scottish Government, many of which are highlighted in the motion, but the true test will be in delivery. And while the indicative figures that were published yesterday do suggest that some interventions may be starting to make a difference, though we are at early stages, the rise in fatalities for women are alarming and we desperately need more targeted services for this group. And while we do not support the Conservatives' amendment, it is right that they highlight the recent report from Audit Scotland and the need for more focus on the root causes of drug and alcohol dependency. By using the extensive powers and resources at disposable, the Government can make real and lasting impact, such as fully funding frontline services for drug treatment and prioritising policies which rejuvenate the most deprived areas. Ministers have had 15 years in which to take decisive action. What impacts could we, have, could we have seen in that time if they'd chosen to act earlier to invest properly in mental health services, drug treatment services and social care, to expand residential rehabilitation, to create clear pathways and support for prisoners with drug problems upon release? The Labour amendment today makes clear that without sufficient investment and action to address inequalities, this failure to make progress will continue. It also references the support for specialist adult drug courts. While this approach was trialled in Scotland, the Scottish Government stopped funding, and it was interesting that the uh, Cabinet Secretary talked about DTOs um, and issues with full compliance. I think the evidence from the drugs court shows that this works well. It supports people through the process. We, in Scotland, we then had a significant closure programme of local courts. That included the closure of the Cooper Sheriff Court, which meant there was insufficient capacity in Scotland, sorry, in Fife, to accommodate the drugs court that was in Fife. We had one in Glasgow and one in Fife. Um, there is now just one left in Glasgow. That does show positive results. At the time, the government said there wasn't enough evidence. They did only have two pilots, so it was difficult to create the evidence when it was so limited. But Glasgow does show that there's strong evidence that adult drug courts reduce both misuse, substance, substance misuse and reoffending. But it's a model that has been allowed to wither. So while I don't anticipate the government will support our amendment, I would ask them to pursue drug courts as a part of the diversionary approach to criminal justice and embedding the person-centred approach to substance use. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. And I now call on Alex Go Hamilton. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Go Hamilton. Very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I start by extending apologies to the Chamber? An urgent appointment will see me absent during closing speeches. I'm very grateful for the Government securing parliamentary time for this important debate. As you know, this is a matter of great importance to Liberal Democrats. Uh, Police Scotland have advised us, as we've heard already, that there were 1,295 suspected drug deaths in our communities in 2021. This is a dip, but it is still among the highest in the world. Uh, that's 1,295 lives needlessly lost, a wealth of potential dashed, and countless families and indeed communities broken. Presiding officer, this cannot continue. This is a particularly Scottish problem of international proportions. It has been a stain on our record for years now. In recent times, Scotland has been taking, on paper at least, a public health approach towards drug deaths, and that was evident in the words of the, Lord, the new Lord Advocate when she addressed this a few months ago. But implementation of such an approach, particularly within the justice system, has been inconsistent. This is starkly evident in the use of fatal accident inquiries in our prisons. This is an issue that my colleague Liam MacArthur, yourself Deputy Presiding Officer, has uh, worked particularly hard on. Um, evidence taken from FAIs show that drug-related deaths are not being treated as the complex issues as, that they are, but rather they are labelled as drug-seeking behaviour or death by misadventure as a choice that one makes. As a result, these cases are not investigated properly and their individuals and their families are not being treated with the dignity and the answers that they deserve. But more crucially, however, it means that lessons are not being learned. 
This is why the Scottish Liberal Democrats have long called for an overall of the FAI system in order to gain an understanding of how to properly tackle substance abuse in the justice system. In addition, we must work faster and harder to see the introduction of safe consumption rooms. They are crucial to lowering the risk of substance use and preventing bloodborne infection and ultimately death. This is why uh, what my party, working alongside amazing activists like Peter Crichton, um, have been advocating for several years now. It is mentioned in the motion today that the government supports the exploration of options to deliver them within the existing legal framework. And I want to believe uh, the government and its intentions here, but I am anxious that this might uh, translate to further delay. I'm also intrigued by, uh, and I echo Claire Baker's questions about detail around the consultation that is mentioned in the last line of the government's motion. I hope we get further clarity on that. The law is not as set in stone regarding this matter as some may think. And I think there was significant reason to believe that there is much more we could achieve and much more the government could do to push the legal boundaries and break the legal impasses we encounter. I, I'm afraid I actually don't have a great deal of time, Mr Whittle. I would otherwise. All this was confirmed by the Lord Advocate last year following my party's campaign for a review on these laws. Let me also be clear, my party, the Liberal Democrats, are open to further discussion around the further devolution of drugs policy to Scotland. This devastating problem is not a deficiency of devolution, nor is it a product of UK government policy. But if devolution of the Misuse of Drugs Act would save lives, then we as Liberal Democrats would not be closed off to that. I think that further, um, bears further scrutiny and discussion. We need to make sure that those in need of help are given it freely, without suspicion, without judgment or punishment. This is why we should be working with the Sentencing Council to offer education and treatment services to those caught in possession of drugs. We must be introducing policies like this as a matter of urgency, but it is surely clear to everyone that as this situation has spiralled out of control to such an extent, we need as much expert advice as we can get. That is why I repeat my call for the World Health Organization to provide specialist drugs task force where we can learn from international examples in Scotland. Presiding officer, we can't just continue to talk about this. We need to act. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Cole Hamilton. We now move to the open debate. Um, I would invite speakers who haven't yet pressed their buttons to, um, to do so. Thank you very much indeed. And I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Annie Wells uh, for up to four minutes, please, Ms. Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I draw members uh, to my register of interests. I'm a councillor in Aberdeen City Council and a member of the Aberdeen City ADP. Uh, today's debate is bittersweet, another reminder of the pervasiveness of our relationship with drugs, but an opportunity to take stock of the work being done and still required to address drug problem, problem drug use and reduce drugs deaths. I welcome the latest Police Scotland figures showing a slight decrease in drugs deaths, but every death is a tragedy. The Criminal Justice Committee has been taking evidence on problem drug use. We see this as a defining challenge of the session. And we also recently joined colleagues from the Health and Social Justice Committees to consider the intersect between health, criminal justice and social justice in tackling problem drug use. And today I want to highlight key points that link to the government motion, but firstly reflect on some witness testimonies that shone a light on the factors that pushed and pulled people into a relationship with drugs. One witness was not a heroin user when he entered a young offenders institute, but after release he became one. Another born into the heroin epidemic of the 80s when, as she put it, crime and drugs took precedence over education and nurturing. Another raised in poverty, experiencing trauma in a violent relationship. By the time she got out, she was broken and using drugs to ease the pain in her head. Witnesses spoke of limited access to person-centred support, that addiction was not severe enough or treatment not available for the drug they used, all further marginalising them at a time of need. We heard about the importance of trauma-informed interactions with police officers, court staff, sheriffs and prison officers. And we welcomed Police Scotland and Crown Office plans to develop trauma-informed training for officers and practitioners, with more solicitors and sheriffs now also trauma-informed. 
and we welcome the task force stigma strategy to address the alienation and damage caused by the war on drugs and their desire that distressed beef interventions be developed. And I know that locally provision of DBI in my constituency was curtailed significantly uh, during the pandemic. Now, we also took evidence on diversion from prosecution. And while there are challenges with monitoring and attendance, there was real consensus that where appropriate, community-based remedies are much preferable to prison sentences. And I welcomed Dr Liz Aston's contribution on the role of police officers in diverting people to drug services. And I welcome the development of programmes such as Navigator that will allow frontline services, frontline staff rather, to undertake first point of contact referral to services and support. Recently, the Lord Advocate announced her decision to extend use of recorded police warnings to include Class A drugs, as the CNAP Cabinet Secretary outlined. And in, her, in her statement, she highlighted the Inverness pilot led by Medics Against Violence that supports referrals to a mentor providing support at the first point of contact with police. And I'd be very interested to hear more about progress on this project. Through care on liberation, including GP access, opiate substitution therapy and take-home naloxone was considered a priority as well as alternatives to remand and imprisonment such as bail supervision and residential rehabilitation. And on naloxone, I welcome the Chief Constable's commitment to national rollout to all police officers and I also wish to commend the Scottish Ambulance Service for their work to develop carriage and use of naloxone. And finally, the committee mm -hmm. heard overwhelming support for law reform to facilitate safe consumption spaces and the Lord Advocate's comments that she would be willing to consider specific proposals pre presented to her on this. So to conclude, Presiding Officer, I hope and expect the committee's work, including our recent joint sessions, will inform the national mission, the delivery on the new, just, new vision for justice to develop a whole system approach, public health based, with person-centred and trauma-informed practices at its heart. Thank you, Ms Nicholl. I now call on Annie Wells to be followed by Gillian Martin for up to four minutes, please, Ms Wells. Thank you, President Officer. The problem of drugs-related deaths in Scotland does remain our national shame. The numbers do not lie. In 2020, we saw around four people losing their lives each day to drugs. As the First Minister admitted, for too long this government had taken its eye off the ball. I recognise the estimated data from Police Scotland suggests the number of people who died from drug-related deaths in 2021 was lower than the year before. But it's clear there is much more we can do, particularly around bolstering rehabilitation facilities. Indeed, only last week did Audit Scotland's astonishing report reveal clear shortcomings in this government's stewardship of our drugs and alcohol services. For many vulnerable people, these services are the last resort to obtain the treatment they need to get better. And that's why the Scottish Conservatives have proposed our Right to Recovery Bill, developed in collaboration with frontline experts, to ensure people have the statutory right to obtain the treatment that's right for them. And I sincerely hope that we can continue to collaborate on this bill, as surely the time has come for us to stand up and say tackling Scotland's drug death crisis should be the defining mission of this Parliament. Presiding officer, substance misuse is also an acute problem across Scotland's justice system, as it is in the wider society. We must be doing our utmost to tackle the supply of drugs into Scotland's prisons. By stemming the flow of deeply dangerous substances, such as so-called spice, it will help protect the well-being of both Scotland's prison officers, who work under extremely difficult circumstances, and those in custody. Recent figures have suggested a fall in drug-soaked male infiltrating of prisons, and this is to be welcomed. And I know my colleague Russell Finlay pushed hard for the SNP government to take seriously the threat of drug-soaked male in our prisons, calling for the introduction of photocopied mail procedures to disrupt the supply of these illicit substances. However, as pointed out by Favour UK, 
Not only has the UK Government's Project Adder been effective in providing support to communities in England and Wales regarding treatment, but has also disrupted organised crime and their supply of illegal substances. As revealed by UK Policing Minister Kit Malthouse, Project Adder has already helped seize up to 27 million benzodiazepine tablets that were destined for Scotland. Project Adder value is clear, and as reflected in our amendment to this, the motion before us, it is deeply regrettable that the Scottish Government has so far not signed up. Presiding officer, tackling the supply of these substances into Scotland's prisons is only part of the solution. We must also focus on demand. We are clear that access to high quality drug treatment and rehabilitation for those across the justice system is vital, including in our prisons. Many in custody are trapped in a cycle of substance misuse, harm and despair. Strengthening rehabilitation for those in custody will not only help safeguard their own well-being, but give them confidence as they look to su successfully reintegrate into society following their release. Most of us are agreed in this chamber that radical action is needed to stem the tide of our drug-related deaths in this country. And while we make every effort to be a constructive opposition, on this most pressing issue, it is also our duty to be upfront about where this government is falling short, and that is what we will continue to do. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wells. I now call on Gillian Martin to be followed by Carol Mochan again up to four minutes, Ms. Martin. Thank you, President Officer. There is no escaping the fact of the matter that many of our prison population are in the criminal justice system as a result of situations that have been influenced by their poor socio economic situation. Many coming from a childhood filled with adverse experiences, often as a consequence of poverty. And many of them have problem drug use also as a result of those often undiagnosed and certainly untreated childhood traumas. Trauma-informed care is essential in all cases of problem drug use, but particularly in our prison settings, where uh, people in our prisons will arrive often with problems with substance use, Mr Finlay. It is our duty of care to facilitate prisons with problem. I will take an intervention in a little while. Let me make some progress. It is our duty of care to facilitate prisoners with problem drug use getting well and back into society with an improved chance of never returning to prison and a chance at having a better life. And if MAT standards are the goal across Scotland, proven standards that get people well, then they must also apply to those with problem drug use in our prisons. And I'll take Mr Finlay's intervention now. Mr Finlay. Thank you. Uh, the member may be aware that the Scottish Prison Survey of 2017 revealed that 13 per cent of prisoners entered custody without a drugs problem but left with one. Yet it took many years for the SNP government to finally act on drug-soaked prison mail. Do you agree that should have been done sooner? Yeah, I, was making the, I was making the point to Mr Finlay because he seems to suggest that people went into prison and, and all of them came out with, with, with drug uh, problems, when actually I was making the point that many of them go into to, to, to prison already with serious problems with drug uh, substance uh, uh, abuse and need help. And I particularly want to use my time today to speak about prisoners with children and how effective treatment and MAT standards is particularly important in their case. The MAT standards say a person should have the support to remain in treatment for as long as requested, and it is particularly important to ensure continuity of that support upon release. It is an already vulnerable time for any offender, as well as a key time in ensuring successful rehabilitation in general. And this is particularly important for those returning to a family home with dependent children. And I believe very strongly that a key part of anyone's rehabilitation is family support, both in terms of their addiction recovery and the recovery from the behaviours that led to their incarceration. And I've spoken before in the Chamber about how important it is to maintain family connections whilst a person is in prison. And I've raised this particularly in relation to HMP Grampian and the Family, and Help Hub, family Centre and Help Hub there, which was run by volunteers and has historically faced cuts as Aberdeen City Council and Aberdeenshire Council in particular have reduced their financial support. The Family Centre is a welcoming place where families can get help and support as well as a place for a cup of tea, something to eat, for visiting partners and a wee play for the kids in a playroom ahead of their visit into the prison estate. This environment means soft interventions and signposting to services can be made and that families are more likely to keep visiting and keeping maintaining those relationships with their family member in prison. 
Um, I have spoken to families outside who have told me of good practice where support is given for fathers in particular, who often had quite difficult relationships with their partners and children, being assisted to play a more active part in family life. And that is facilitated by both prison staff and the visitor centre. Um, becoming a better parent, ready to make a successful and permanent return to the family home more likely. And that cycle of ACEs can be broken. And I see match standards complete with positive family access and support being key in breaking that cycle. The families outside facility that have a visit from EHMP Grampian, and I came away thinking that every single prison in Scotland should have a centre like that. I'd be happy to speak to the Justice Secretary about the, the funding shortfall there. But before I finish, President Officer, I do want to say how much I fundamentally disagree with the Conservative Amendments Clause, which seems to suggest that anyone in possession of Class A drugs should be criminalised. Diversion from prosecution, a presumption against short sense, is not an ideological position. It is one backed up with expert opinion on success rehabilitation. Our law enforcement uh, resources should not be used to immediately criminalise victims of the illegal drug trade, often very ill and vulnerable people who time after time have been dealt a raw deal by society. The buying them up and throw away the key ideology might play well with Daily Mail readers, but when it comes to getting people well and improving the lives of families affected by problem drug use, particularly children, demanding the state puts ill people into the justice system for possession is simply ill-informed, backwards and ultimately is the rhetoric of the angry mob. Thank you, Ms Martin. And I now call on Carol Mochan to be followed by Stuart McMillan for up to four minutes, please, Ms Mochan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. May I thank everyone who has contributed to this necessary debate so far for their contributions. From our part, I would like to focus on the problems evident in our prisons. When we talk about problems with substance misuse, we are really talking about people who have, for one reason or another, slipped through the net. And in so many cases, they will encounter some form of the justice system along that path. Fortunately, we now seem to be at a point where the vast majority recognise that simply locking up someone with a serious addiction will not make that problem go away. Evidence shows prison, stay, prison stays only exacerbate existing substance misuse problems, leaving a legacy of addiction and distress. Whether prisons can be reformed to prevent this and provide the opportunity for more substance rehabilitation is perhaps a wider debate, but it is one we dearly need to have. We won't be able to get through all of that today, but what we can see is that the current model is not working. Where there should be adequate support to get drug users back on their feet, there is still far too often more of a focus on abstinence and a lack of effective intervention to look at a person's misuse from a long-term perspective. But above all, the most significant barrier to any progress is the massive overcrowding within our prison system. The incredibly hard-working healthcare staff who work in prisons are facing unimaginable pressures already, and on top of that, they must manage time constraints that in any ordinary circumstances would be deemed completely unacceptable. There are so few of them, and yet so many people who need help. So as always, just like a vast number of problems we speak about in this chamber, we are expect expecting exceptional results, but we seem unwilling to fund them. It is time we viewed prison, if we insist on sending so many people there, as a unique opportunity to address many of the health inequalities that blight the worst, of our in our society, worst off in our society. Yet, due, due to the same pressures on the entire NHS, with the added problems of working in a fractious and poorly managed environment, this is always going to be very difficult to achieve for staff who feel like they are not always being supported. In order to give them that support, we need to be honest with the public that to tackle the drug problem in this country and make our justice system more effective, we will require greater investment and a much longer term approach. Two things that the world of politics is often poorly prepared to deal with. If we continue to, each, to address each problem individually, then it will take a great deal of time to make any headway. However, as you would expect, my position is a socialist one, and that is a position of understanding that the root of all of these problems is socio-economic inequality, inequality that has gone on for generations and will continue to be persevere for generations to come if more is not done. If we do not seriously tackle the low pay, the high de debt, the exorbitant housing costs society that we have built, 
then reliance on substances to deal with these pressures will only get worse. The minute someone is made homeless or put on the cusp of homeless, homelessness through losing a job or unaffordable rents, then their health, their mental and physical will rapidly deteriorate and the likelihood they will look to substances to alleviate that pressure will increase. These are largely the people who end up in our prisons, so I ask again, why are we not dealing with the problems at source? Scottish Labour believes that we must begin to look at the several decades in which drug misuse has spiralled out of control in Scotland, and we have come to the conclusion that this should be a top priority for every government, not just here in Edinburgh, but in London too, and it needs to remain a priority for a long time to come. There will be, need to conclude no, now, there will be no overnight fix, and I ask that we continue with this important work. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Mochan. I'm afraid we are now well over time, so I'm going to have to insist that colleagues stick to their time limit. Uh, with that instruction, I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Sue Webber. Up to four minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, at the outset, I want to remind the Chamber that uh, I'm a board member of Moving On Inverclyde, a local addiction service. Like others, I want to add my condolences to the families of people who have lost their lives uh, due to drugs. Every life lost to drugs is a tragedy and one that we as a society do need to address. Returning substance abuse from a justice to a health priority is imperative, and the direction of travel in that regard is positive. And it's absolutely vital that treatment and recovery that is right for individuals is available at the right time. This is a crucial key factor of the national mission. It's also worth reminding the Chamber of the SNP manifesto from last year's parliamentary election, which committed the SNP-led government to develop a new national community justice strategy. As the government motion states, and I quote, determines that access to high quality drug treatment, rehabilitation and recovery services at appropriate points in the justice system. No one in this chamber can actually argue against that. And the work that takes place in our prison state to help prisoners with addictions is something that we should all be supporting. Now, can we do more? Absolutely, we can do more. We can always do more in every single aspect of our lives. However, it is vital that we ensure that the cycle of reoffending is broken to help rebuild lives. The reinforcement a commitment to continue to improve support for people leaving prison is also something that every single one of us can support. And one of the key ways of helping deal with this is in tackling stigma. I have spoken to various people over the years about uh, people whose lives have been blighted uh, by addictions. And the issue of stigma is a constant. And if this Parliament genuinely believes that dealing with the drugs death situation that Scotland has, uh, then that is we really got some uh, genuine and hard questions to put to ourselves, but also to society. Annie Wells touched upon earlier on regarding the issue of reintegration into society. Uh, and I certainly I agree with Annie Wells on that particular point, but I think that the issue of stigma, dealing with stigma, is also crucial to help with that reintegration. Uh, the national mission, uh, led by the Drugs Policy Minister, Angela Constance, is clearly leaving no stone unturned. And working with people with lived experiences is absolutely essential. Now, I welcome the creation of the National Collaborative, chaired by Professor Alan Miller, and his commitment to ensure that the views of people with lived and living experiences are reflected. The fact that bringing people together who have been affected by drugs to make recommendations to the Scottish Government about changes to services can only help improve and also save lives. As part of the, the new Vision for Justice policy announced last month, uh, the Scottish Government's ambition, shared with COSLA and many other partners, is for a trauma-informed and trauma-responsive workforce across Scotland to address inequalities and improve life chances, ensuring that services and care are delivered in ways that, first of all, are informed by people with lived experience. It also recognises the importance of well-being in the workforce, recognises where people are affected by trauma and adversity. It responds in ways that prevents further harm and supports recovery and also can address inequalities and improve life chances. Embedding trauma in foreign practice will ensure that Scotland's justice services recognise the prevalence of trauma and adversity, realise where people are affected by trauma and also respond in ways that reduce re-traumatisation. I'm saying also finally, uh, today and previously, uh, we have heard from some members about their opposition to the new approach adopted by the Lord Advocate with regards to the diversion from prosecution. 
In Scotland, prosecutors are provided with a range of alternatives to prosecution, including diversion from prosecution to respond appropriately to the facts and circumstances of each specific case. It is obvious that, that there, is a, there is no one size fits all, and, uh, and certainly there is a long journey ahead. However, I believe that we are now moving in the right direction, but I do also want to highlight that there is a long, long journey ahead. Thank, Thank you, Mr McMillan. I now call on Sue Webber, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Up to four minutes, Ms Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And yes, I'd like to draw your attention to my register of interests as a City of Edinburgh councillor and a member of the EADP. This is a very important debate and one that I'm glad to have the chance to speak in as the Shadow Minister for Public Health, including Drugs Policy. I'm just sorry I'm not there in the chamber today. Under the SNP's watch, drug-related deaths have tripled, while rehabilitation services have trailed far behind. The number of drug deaths in Scotland continues to shame the nation and is a damning indictment of the First Minister having, in her own words, taken her eye off the ball. Figures from Police Scotland show that there were 1,295 suspected drug deaths between January and December 21, which is likely to remain the highest per capita figure in Western Europe. Scotland's drug death rate is also three and a half times that of the UK as a whole. In addition, the latest report shows the number of female deaths has risen from 345 in 2020 to 356 in 2021 with women now making up 27% of the victims. The number of women dying from drugs is especially worrying, and it's high time the SNP got a grip of the sickening epidemic. You have said yourself, Minister, that the Scottish Government needs to do more to help female victims, including more women-specific services. The treatment plans offered must be tailored to enable women to access them. So, for example, daytime recovery sessions need to be provided to women who have children to care for, because residential rehab programmes won't suit or be an option for everyone. I recently visited the River Garden Auckland Charity in Ayrshire. It is a training and social enterprise development centre offering a residential programme for people in the early stages of recovery from drug and or alcohol addiction. Their model has up to an 80 per cent recovery rate globally on completion of the programme. It was a truly fascinating visit, and I was heartened to hear that they are expanding and building a women-only residential block. The feeling of calm that I experienced on arriving was noticeable, and it leaves me in no doubt that the location and surroundings are so key to the successes it achieves. These types of facilities and programmes have shown to be successful and should be properly funded to ensure they continue to make strides in this difficult and challenging field. And although not specifically related to drug misuse, misuse, there was an insightful study carried out in South Korea. This study revealed that a therapeutic, community-oriented day programme resulted in continuous abstinence rates at six months, nearly eight times higher than those seen in the control group. Both the treatment group and the control group were women. Instinctively, when it comes to treating dependency, men and women will have different needs. So we must ask ourselves, what more can we do to address the needs of women specifically? This week, Anne-Marie Ward, a leading drugs campaigner in Scotland, expressed doubt over the latest drug death figures, warning that some overdose may have been wrongly classified as COVID fatalities. And the SNP government yesterday said there had been an 8 per cent fall in suspected drug deaths last year. However, the head of one of the country's top recovery char charities says reports from the front line suggested the crisis has not improved, and the numbers, remember, are still higher than 2019. Our focus should be on improving access to rehabilitation and treatment, and this is just as valid for prisoners too. This is why I would urge once again that the SNP government must back our Right to Recovery Bill, which is backed by experts in the addiction field and would enshrine in law the right of everyone in Scotland to receive potentially life-saving treatment. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Webber. And I call on Maggie Chapman to be followed by Eleanor Whitham for up to four minutes. Ms. Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by restating what others have said. Every drug-related death is a tragedy, and my sincere condolences to all those who have been affected by such a death. The drugs death crisis is a public health crisis. It is not inevitable. 
And it is high time that we are at last seeing the shift in political positioning, from most in this chamber at any rate, around how we tackle this. As I've said before, we need a culture of care, not a war on drugs. Because the war on drugs has been an abject failure, both in terms of restricting the use of drugs and in protecting individuals and communities from the harm of drugs. Criminalising users and petty suppliers rather than seeking solutions to the deeper problems that underpin substance use has not worked. We need to understand the underlying causes that lead people to use drugs and develop addictions and tackle those if we are to effectively deal with a crisis that is not inevitable. This means holistic interventions that do not treat the substance use or, de or dependency in isolation, but consider all of the person's experiences and challenges, their economic conditions, housing, family relationships, and so much more. Drug dependency is like the canary in the mine for trauma, poverty, and other social ills. It is a long-term and complex issue and can only be fully tackled when recovery happens at every level of a person's life. Addressing substance misuse in this context can bring significant co-benefits in terms of better stability, health, and so on. And it means, as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, rethinking our approaches across the justice system. Prison is not a good place to be. I get that that is the point. But when dealing with substance dependency issues, prison might be the very worst place for someone. There are high levels of drug use among people arriving at, pres at prison while, while they are incarcerated and on leaving prison, including many whose substance use only begins for the first time in prison. Drugs deaths are also especially high among people while incarcerated and after being released. People in prison need support, support which meets their individual needs and focuses on their challenges in a trauma-informed, person-centred way. We must consider the issues of demand, isolation, long periods of being locked in cells, lack of appropriate activity. All of these make it more likely that people in prison will turn to substance use. And rigid drug testing in prisons may dissuade people from seeking help or encourage them to use less detectable, perhaps more dangerous substances. We also know that levels of reoffending are directly related to levels of post-release support available. So coordination between and across agencies is vital, including links to appropriate community support. There is significant evidence that suggests interventions in prison tend to be less effective than those in community, and they are definitely more costly. These reasons, among others, are why community justice and other alternatives to prison are so important in our collective cross-departmental efforts to tackle drugs deaths and substance addiction, as well as the causes of criminal behaviour. Addressing people's substance abuse problems requires work at community level, as well as at an individual level, using a wide range of policies and systems. We need to ensure that approaches take account of people's age, gender, race, and so on. Strict treatment orders might, not, might just not work for some people, especially young people. Similarly, some people may have caring responsibilities or may have concerns about losing their tenancy, which means that residential treatment might not work for them either. So, in closing, presiding officer, we must ensure appropriate resources are available in the community sector as well as in our police and prison services. We must acknowledge the connections between all government departments and therefore the importance of a whole government approach. Only then can we tackle what is a public health issue with care and humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now call on Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Michael Mara for up to four minutes, Ms Whittam. Deputy Presiding Officer, I live beside a church that has a very old cemetery that contains several Covenanter graves, and despite a sterling effort by the church and the local authority, at times it needs some extra attention to ensure its up to upkeep and preservation. Last year, as I walked past on the way to the shops, I could hear tattering voices accompanied by the sound of power tools and lots of activity. I kicked in the side gate to see a group of folk hard at work tending the cemetery and engaging each other in jovial conversation. Great to see, I thought to myself. On my way back from the shops a wee while later, as I walked down the lane behind a woman carrying a shovel over her shoulder, she was singing to herself as she made her way to their vehicle. She blushed when she saw me as she was having, and she said to me, I was having such a good day, I just had to sing. She then went on to say she was doing community service and was almost apologetic about it. The stigma she felt was writ large across her face. 
She had gone from being so happy she was singing to be embarrassed by why she was there that day. I responded positively to her to say thank you to the entire crew who had made such a wonderful job of the cemetery and said she should be proud of what she had achieved that day and never to let anybody stop her singing. I walked home thinking about how it is the small things that make all the difference to an individual's feeling of self-worth and just how much stigma impacts upon somebody's ability to enter and sustain recovery and avoid repeated interactions with the criminal justice services. Later that evening, I posted photos and a thank you on my social media that was positively received by the wider community and I hope went a wee ways to breaking down those layers of stigma. You see, presiding officer, after having worked for many years supporting people facing addiction, homelessness, grinding poverty, mental health issues and multiple and complex trauma, I understand fully that self-worth all but disappears when you're facing a world full of chaos with repeated periods of incarceration, meaning any real chance of entering into and maintaining recovery can seem almost absolutely impossible. I saw this time and time again. There's no doubt for me that trauma and poverty exacerbated by stigma can be what leads someone to self-medicate as they seek to plot out that which they are unable to work through. These can be the very same people who enter into a revolving door of incarceration, liberation, problem drug use, homelessness and repeat. And whilst it is not everyone who has experienced trauma that will end up in this situation, just about everyone in that situation has experienced trauma. And that is why this must be seen as a public health emergency and a national mission. We must move away from a justice system that re-traumatises people. And that is why I fully support the Scottish Government's new vision for justice that has at its heart a trauma framework, giving staff the knowledge and skills they need to embed trauma-informed practices. Recognising the prevalence of trauma and adversity experienced by those interacting with the criminal justice system will help us as a nation to tackle repeat offending and, importantly, our national loss to drugs deaths. The enormity of that loss is felt keenly by the families affected, but we also need to recognise that as a country we have lost far too many people, and with them all of their hopes, their dreams and their talents. There is no one-size-fits-all approach here, but a combination of access to same-day treatment by embedding the match standards, widening access to rehab, diversion from prosecution, funded recovery community supports, the navigators, a national um, nationwide naloxone rollout, meaningful and funded community justice options, funding facilities such as River Garden in my constituency, which Sue Weber has um, already mentioned, gives us the best chance of preventing the worst outcomes. Make no mistake, community justice and diversion from pr prosecution are not soft justice, they are smart justice. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Whitham. And I call on Michael Mara to be followed by Stephanie Callan for up to four minutes, Mr. Mara. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In, in recent years, there has been an unacceptable increase in drug related harm in our prisons, with an 18 fold increase in types of drug seizures within the space of a year. There has been an increase in street volume in synthetic cannabinoids, but also in psychoactive substances and cocaine. Synthetic cannabinoids and benzodiazepine mixes are emerging in prisons and, frankly, we have no idea what these do to people. Like Scotland's streets, Scotland's prisons are awash with drugs. And I don't say that for controversy or for headlines. We must accept the reality of the situation if it is to be dealt with. The latest Scottish prisoner survey sets out that four in ten prisoners had used drugs during their time in prison. The research group that I ran at the University of Dundee would analyse children's drawings soaked in psychoactive drugs, dried and then posted into prisons and then smoked. The government has taken action to deal with this by enabling the folk copying of mail, but for every solution there will be another cunning means of dealers accessing a captive marketplace where losing yourself from the daily reality of a limited life is a premium product. For example, photographs being received in the mail are now being used in the same way, but are classified differently as personal possessions rather than as mail. And I'd ask the Minister, uh, dealing with some of these issues, to consider piloting a wastewater analysis scheme in the prison estate in Scotland to best identify the types of drugs in circulation. SEPA certainly have the capability to work with analysts to put this place in short order. Rapid analysis could help with health measures. Understanding what someone has taken is vital to ensuring that they receive appropriate health care and can also help with behaviour management as some substances will result in higher levels of aggression towards staff and other inmates. I would welcome the Minister's response on this suggestion. Just as in Scotland streets, all of this equates to an incredible loss of human life, human potential, and it tears families and communities apart. 
So in preparing for this debate, I asked Spice for information on uh, the number of citizens entering prison clean of drugs and emerging with drugs problems. They told me that that data does not exist. Mr Finlay quoted um, a 13 per cent figure from 2017. It is my understanding those figures relate to England and Wales and not Scotland at all, and that there is no analysis is actually captured. We, we can perhaps compare notes on that um, after the debate. But the um, citizens are at their most vulnerable when they emerge from the prison estate, uh, many with no real home to go to, no productive way to spend their time, and the stigma that we have heard about uh, quite frequently in the debate that sur the debate surrounds them, they are very susceptible to falling back into uh, usage uh, with reduced tolerance levels, and overdose is very common. So again, in preparing for this debate, I asked Spice for information on the number of citizens leaving prison who then rapidly overdose, and that data does not exist either. Data that is now five years old does show that Scotland's drug deaths uh, have an inherent connection with prison, with over half of those having lost their lives having been in prison before. Such a common factor and so identifiable, yet nothing is done to immediately identify those for whom the impact is immediate and so severe. That is an intoler intolerable dereliction of duty of care from the state, but it is being tolerated daily across Scotland. The figures we have seen on suspected drug deaths in recent days show that there is the possibility of some very limited progress. But we must know why and where. If something has worked, how can it be replicated? If change is driven by external factors in the drugs market, where there might be issues of purity, supply or the myriad other possibilities, what controlled analysis can be undertaken so that those uh, factors can be acknowledged? If we do not do this, then we cannot lock in any progress. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Murrah. We now call the final speaker in the open debate, Stephanie Callaghan, who joins us remotely. Up to four minutes, Ms Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks to Keith Brown for bringing this important Scottish Government debate to the Chamber. A public health emergency currently ravages Scotland's communities. And a report from Police Scotland on suspected drug deaths during 2021 said estimated 1,295 deaths. So many mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbours and colleagues, all of them gone too soon. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government and everybody in this, changer, in this chamber knows that we can and we must do better. Funding is hugely important, and we need to better understand where and how that money is spent and what real difference it is making to people's lives. Audit Scotland recommended greater transparency, and the Scottish Government has taken that on board because we need to understand what is working well and what is not, and the impact policies have on lived experience. What we all want to see is our national mission dramatically cutting drug deaths and quickly. I am sure I am not alone in often feeling that we are not going fast enough, but at the same time, I understand that we need all that research, strategic thinking, data collection, targets, systems for measuring progress, all the number crunching and stats to help us to save lives. Presiding officer, the role of the justice system is a critical pillar of our mission, and people who face the justice system and have challenges around substance misuse need and deserve access to the treatments that work for them and that heal their trauma. Our priority must be to divert vulnerable people away from prison and into treatment, whatever that is possible. Continuing to embed the new uh, medication-assisted treatment standards reinforces a rights-based approach to treatment, and these standards help frame an entire response, encouraging flexibility and urgency. There is no one-size-fits-all, and equal rights to access treatment is really key. High-quality drug treatment, rehabilitation recovery, recovery services must run through the rural justice system, and that includes prisons and police care, as people have commented before. International evidence is very clear. Prison damages people. People lose their homes, it weakens their social ties, it limits their employment, breaks up families and creates a stigma that can be really, really hard to escape. Ultimately, prison sentences increase the likelihood of continued drug use. And stigma does not stop with the people that are battling drugs misuse. It extends to those working to support and help them at times. Why? Because stigma is cumulative and it is long-lasting. And society has treated substance users with disdain and disgust for a very long time, often viewing them as worthless. While Scottish Government policy now frames drug use as a health issue, many in society too often regard vulnerable people as criminals, rather than people that are needing help. Time to remove stigma is now, and we in this chamber have a really important role to play. 
we can highlight how providing access to different forms of justice, including non-legal solutions, and following up with personalised drug, alcohol and mental health services really does help address the underlying causes of offending, and that helps keep our communities safer places. Deciding officer, we must celebrate the success of people who move beyond problem drug use. Just over a week ago, I attended the funeral of an amazing woman, my mum's friend, who struggled with drugs misuse for decades and later became very involved with church life and helping others. I joined her children, grandchildren and other family and friends to celebrate her life. And the eulogy was really beautiful. Facing her struggles with drugs head on and pulling no punches around the trauma she suffered. But more than anything, it captured how she made people feel. Warm, accepted, supported and valued. She was a real character and a free spirit until the end, but she made you feel comfortable in your own skin. She struggled with drugs, but she also had an amazing heart. She was not a bad person. In closing, presiding officer, we need to help people rebuild their lives. We need to normalise helping people in need. We need to be leaders in policy and break away from convention when that's needed. And we need to do whatever it takes to tackle this public health emergency. For all of our sakes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Callahan. We now move to closing speeches, and I call Katie Clark for up to six, uh, six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. All in this chamber know the statistics that Scotland has by far the highest drug death rate recorded in any country in Europe, and that last year, yet again, there was a record number of deaths for the seventh year in a row. The number of drug-related deaths is now almost three times higher than it was a decade ago, but we discuss this as if it's a new problem. We've been here before. Damning reports are published. Strategies are announced. Working groups are established and recommendations are made. As Alex Cole Hamilton said, the problem is implementation. The Cabinet Secretary is correct to say that a trauma-informed and person-centred approach is not a soft option and that individuals must be treated with respect. As Claire Baker, Maggie Chapman and many others have said, we need a public health approach. It's right that we question why it is that Scotland has the highest number of death rates in Scotland. It's in Europe. It's clear that tackling substance use will require policies that address poverty, deprivation and Scotland's wider health inequalities, which Carol Mocken spoke about. As Eleanor Wisdom said, we know that often people with serious drug addictions also have mental health issues and also, more often than not, have experienced trauma. Many have faced grinding poverty and the knock-on effects of a lack of hope and aspiration for a, for a decent future. Scotland has almost 60,000 people with a drug problem. And one person who has a drug problem has many friends and relatives who are also affected by that drug use. So, we need to make sure that we listen to what the experts are saying. And I believe that many in this chamber have highlighted the action that needs to be taken. Audrey Nicholls spoke about the work of the Criminal Justice Committee and the need for alternatives to custody. Annie Wells also spoke about the importance of access to rehabilitation. We simply don't have enough people in treatment. Scotland only has about 40% of people in treatment at any one time, whereas in England, for example, it's 60%. It's clear that there's a clear, ring, clear link between drug taking and committing offences. And in the last 10 years, the percentage of people testing positive for illegal drugs when entering prison has ranged between 70% and 78%. And as Michael Mara has spoken about, new psychoactive substances have become an increasing problem and many believe they are now dominant in prisons. We know that drug use continues to be a significant problem in prisons. And the latest um, drug survey, which Michael Mara all, uh, also pointed to, identified that about two-fifths of people have used illicit drugs in prison at some point. But as a number 
of speech this have highlighted, there is a lack of support in prison. Prisons need, prisoners need support to come off drugs, support that must continue when they are released, as Strick McMillan spoke about. The Drugs Deaths Task Force recommended this back in April 2020, saying that adequate through care provision should be made available to prisoners on liberation. Currently, though, I think we all accept that those who leave prison and are relocated into communities are not receiving that care in the numbers that they should. So it's important um, that we not only address um, the risk of death um, from overdose in prison, but also the risks in the months after leaving custody. We know that we face major challenges, which will only be addressed with policies that are underpinned by sufficient investment. We also, also know that prison is more expensive than the alternatives to custody. But Scotland continues to send the highest number of people to prison in Western Europe. I believe that the Scottish Government has much of its policy in this area in the right place, but simply hasn't been implementing those policies. They have the support of Scottish Labour to implement those policies, as we know that if there was this disconnect addressed between what's said in this chamber and was what is actually happening in reality in the justice system, it would make a massive difference to thousands in the prison system and many more in communities up and down Scotland. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Clark. I now call on Jamie Green uh, for up to seven minutes, Mr Green. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is the depressingly familiar ritual in Scottish politics which takes place most often in this chamber when drug statistics are released. There's cross-party shock and horror. There's an acceptance that we all should do more. There's even an acceptance we could work a little bit more constructively and collaboratively. There's promises from the government of more action and more money. And today's debate, I think, has followed that very predictable tone. But the reason it's been repeated every year is because the scale of the problem is immense, but the scale of the solution has never matched that problem. And if it had it matched the scale of the problem, then these numbers would have been falling already. Now, last year, according to Police Scotland, we lost 1,295 lives to drugs in Scotland. Uh, and of course, if it is a reduction, it is a very welcome one from the record high we saw in 2020. But there are two brief notes of caution in these statistics. The first is that we've previously, as a parliament, been using NRS figures as the metric for comparison rather than Police Scotland's. So let's wait until we see those published. Uh, we should tread carefully uh, in doing so. But secondly, even if there is that welcome reduction, I really hope there is one. It still remains the highest in Europe, and it still remains three and a half times the rate as the rest of the UK, even against the backdrop of the same legislative environment, a point made by Claire Baker. Particularly concerning is the rise, uh, according to these figures, of 3% in female drug deaths last year. Of course, most drug deaths do involve uh, men, but there is very real and very damaging effect on women across Scotland, not just those who themselves suffer from addiction, but those whose partners or family members do too. So we need to make sure that our response is tailored to the individual needs. A point that Sue Weber made, the importance of uh, residential rehab programmes, for example, not always being suitable for women, mothers or those with childcare responsibilities. I was really struck by the example she shared of good work and good practice at the River Garden uh, Centre in Ayrshire. And I have seen the good and bad of rehab services in helping constituents and others. It can be a game changer and it quite, quite literally can be a life saver as well. But let's also be clear, and this must make for difficult reading and hearing for the government. Audit Scotland's review into drug and alcohol uh, services released just a few days ago was not just worrying, it painted a quite a grim picture of services in Scotland. High risk alcohol and problematic drug use remains stubbornly high. Drug related deaths and alcohol admissions are actually increasing and we know that already that problematic alcohol and drug use disproportionately impacts our most deprived communities. But here's what Audit Scotland also pointed out. In 2015, there were 706 tragic deaths to drugs. By 2018, that had risen to 1,200, and that had almost doubled by 2020. But at the same time, 
It also pointed out that in the year 2016-17, there had been a 20% funding cut to ADPs year on year, from 70 million down to 53 million. And I'm sorry, but if you cut funding to ADPs, it cannot be a huge surprise that in the years that follow, there will be a rise in those horrific statistics. This isn't taking your eye off the ball. This is taking your pen off the checkbook. And that has been the problem. That's a point that many of us have raised consistently year after year, which is actually why our right to recovery bill is important. It's not just a press release. It would provide a statutory right for addicts to receive addiction, and it would ensure that our recovery services are best uh, equipped, resourced and funded to meet the needs of individuals. Because currently only one in seven residential rehab beds are publicly funded. And no one, no one in Scotland should be denied uh, a treatment because of a place is not available to them or because they don't have enough money to fund it themselves. That is a shocking place to be. And I would say to Julian Martin, actually, our right to recovery would enclose, include those who are in prison because they have just as much a right to recovery as anyone else. And in, in my committee visit to HMP Edinburgh, I met some inmates who had been recovering from addiction services. And, and that was great, and it was positive to see those stories, but it was equally shocking to be told that it's easier to get drugs in prison than it is on the streets. In fact, we heard there are people coming into the prison estate with no drug problem, who had never even tried drugs, and are leaving with a problem. That is shocking. I welcome the government's commitment to improve access to support and follow through care for those leaving prison. And I'm happy to work with the government positively and constructively on all of that. But we cannot agree with every step that they have taken. Because the issue of changes to how frontline police officers deal with Class A drugs, I, I think, uh, has taken the wrong turn. I think, arguably, it makes it difficult for law enforcement to stop criminals both supplying to vulnerable people, but using vulnerable people to get their drugs onto uh, the streets. I, I, if I have any time to give, I would love to have a proper debate, but I'm just really accommodate it in your apologies. But I'm happy to have this conversation with the Cabinet Secretary. Because what we haven't heard today is getting the drugs off our streets in the first place. They don't magic themselves there. Because there are wholesale factories in the UK and across Europe wholesale factories making pills by the millions. There's heroin and cocaine getting out of continents and into our islands. And tackling that at the higher echelons surely must feature somewhere. We've heard none of that today. And on the issue of diversion from prosecution, I just want to raise one statistic with the Chamber. Since that same approach was used for Class B and C drugs in 2016, the number of people caught in possession has increased. It was 21,300 in the year 2016-17. There was a change in policy, a change in approach by policing. In the year 2019-20, the possession rate had gone up to 22,900, nearly 23,000. So the question we must ask ourselves is, really, if this is the approach, is it working? If the premise of diversion to prosecution is reduction in usage, then why are the numbers going up? Why is possession going up? Why is there an increase? not a decrease. We've heard lots of other good contributions. I don't have time to go into them in detail. Uh, Brian Whittle talked about diversion prosecution. Annie Wells made points about stopping drugs uh, getting into our prisons, as did Michael Mara. In fact, when you close one door, surely another one will simply open. Uh, or serious organised uh, criminals will do what they can to ensure that their product is still punted to those who want it. But I want to close really with the words of Stephanie Callaghan, whose contribution I think was notable. Because I think what she did is very emotionally remind us that behind every statistic is a person, a friend, a colleague and a family member. And I think that's something perhaps we should all and perhaps could all remember a little bit more. The scale of this challenge must be matched by the scale of our response, by our ambition and not just that, by the scale of the government's investment, top down, right to those frontline services. So I ask the Minister and the government, it's not too late for others, but it is too late for some. Get that money to where it needs, because if we don't, these figures are never, ever going to drop. Uh, thank you, members, for your contributions today. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Green. I now call on the Minister to wind up the debate for uh, up to nine minutes, please, Ms Constance. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I want to start by quoting a mum, a mum called Libby. I don't know Libby, but she replied to one of my social media posts on the suspected drug deaths figures uh, for 2021. And she quite simply said that one life lost is one too many. 
And in reflecting upon the reduction of uh, reported suspected deaths by uh, Police Scotland, um, we know that we can overread these statistics. Uh, this information is published more regularly, actually at the request of Parliament uh, for more uh, timely reporting. But we, of course, wait for the confirmed uh, drug death statistics, which will be published uh, by the National Records of Scotland um, in July. And the harsh reality is that the death toll is heartbreaking. And every life lost will always be one too many. But there is no complacency, and there can never be any conceit, and there can never be any acceptance that the status quo is hopeless and that it can't be changed, because it can be changed. And our priority in this national mission is to be relentlessly focused on getting more people into treatment that works for them. So in addition to our work to embed MAT standards and investing and expanding residential rehabilitation, I am pleased to announce a new target to get more people into a protective treatment. And again, this was something I promised Parliament to bring forward. Around 90% of all drug-related deaths involve opiates. Uh, therefore, the first phase of a challenging new target will be to get more people into community-based opiate substitute therapy. Currently, there is 29,500 people in receipt of OST, and a new target uh, to increase this by 2024 by almost 10% uh, is to uh, 32,000. Now, for some areas um, in Glasgow, this will mean they will have to get 500 more people into treatment. And there is a, a wealth of international evidence that supports OST, and we need to be fearless in challenging the stigma around it. But equally, and I want to be clear on this point, that prescribed drug treatment is not and cannot be the only treatment option available. Hence, our commitment to standards on options and choices, including abstinence-based recovery. Of course. Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Just, um, I do welcome the target that's been set. Could the Minister confirm that this would include access to um, Buvidal, Buvidal and, and also progress on heroin assisted treatment would be helpful? Minister. Yes, so absolutely. That's an important point in terms of MAT standards, in terms of choice. Uh, we know that some of the work that took place um, in prisons uh, during uh, the pandemic in terms of the introduction of, of Buvidal uh, showed that for some people this was a, a more optimal uh, treatment uh, choice um, and that we are continuing to um, engage uh, with health boards uh, where there has been some interest uh, in heroin assisted treatment but we need to turn that interest uh, into a commitment uh, to expand that as a treatment option and I recently had the great pleasure um, of visiting the, the heroin assisted treatment project in Glasgow uh, and its evaluation is due soon uh, and I'm really hopeful that we can uh, use that uh, to, to get other projects um, over, over the line and we have some financial resource um, committed um, to that. Can I also say, President Officer, phase two of our treatment target will be to expand the target to include all drugs, um, including alcohol. And I have written to the Health Committee, uh, offering to brief committee in much more detail about the treatment target, uh, but also to come and talk to committee uh, about the, the, the Audit Scotland report. Because there is a, a wealth of work around accountability, governance, value for money and better use of data that we have started and work that we will continue to pursue. And I welcome the Audit Scotland report and in paragraph 16 of the Audit Scotland report it acknowledges that there has been a 67% real terms increase in funding from 2000, um, uh, to 2015-16 to this um, financial year. So, but what I'll also um, say to Chamber is that despite this record investment of this year and the gathering and publishing of more information than ever before, of equal importance is accountability, transparency and measuring impact to ensure that we can make every penny count. Um, and part of uh, the planning uh, amongst myself and my officials is indeed to bring forward that cross-cutting plan 
uh, to ensure that the national mission is kept on track uh, and it's of sufficient uh, breadth and depth and it cuts right across prevention and early intervention, uh, recovery orientated care, public health approach, justice, mental health, family support um, and reducing um, social harms. Absolutely. I was going to get to your point, but... <laughs> Brian Whistle. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the member taking the intervention. Would, and, and that point about transparency, would she uh, agree with me that perhaps, uh, the, the, I know she agrees with me on the importance of the third sector, and perhaps the, the, the money intended uh, from the government to get to the third sector is not always getting there. Is there a way in which we could track the money better to make sure it gets to those third sector organisations that, that do so much good in this, this area? Minister. So, in, in short, presiding officer, um, there is. We have made uh, significant commitments and are, are indeed uh, have significant funds to support uh, the voluntary sector. But I think there is much more we can do to assist that and improve uh, uh, transparency, particularly in terms uh, of the funds that are rooted through alcohol and drug partnerships. And I was also really pleased that, that Sue Webber has visited uh, River Garden in Ayrshire. Uh, she may recall that the last time I was in Parliament um, uh, on the front bench, um, we made an announcement uh, that announced significant funding uh, for the project in River Garden uh, to assist them, amongst many things, uh, to be able to accommodate um, more, more women. I want to say a quick word about young people because there is a relationship um, about hospital admissions, increased hospital admissions, whether that's to a &E or psychiatric admissions, in relation to drug use, uh, such as cannabis, uh, that is uh, involved in a deterioration in the mental health of young people. And that's why we need to have more age-appropriate services. There is work underway. I've answered lots of uh, written parliamentary questions on this point uh, that Claire Baker um, has uh, tabled. But we have to also be clear what does not help young people would be to push them up tariff in the criminal justice system uh, with convictions in and around the possession of drugs. So instead of having a debate about what's best for young people, some of this debate has been about a mischaracterisation of the option of recorded uh, police warnings. And we do need to be prepared to debate drug law reform, whether it's at a Scottish Government level, but also um, at a UK level. And I would be interested in pursuing discussions with Claire Baker um, and Alex Cole Hamilton about how we could ensure that we do that in an evidence-based way and in a, in a collaborative uh, fashion uh, as well. Because the international evidence is clear. Excessively punitive measures increase harms. Harm reduction is effective in reducing deaths. Diversion works in terms of reducing uh, re-offending. And just also to say, perhaps in a more collegiate note about Project Adder, we do participate uh, in uh, the learning network, so we do monitor and keep an eye on uh, developments um, elsewhere. But the issue about the Misuse of Drugs Act is that it limits um, the full implementation of a public health approach and it limits that reorientation um, of, of, of practice. Because there is something much wider about a cultural change because the focus needs not to be on criminalising people with multiple and complex needs whose experienced, who have experienced serious disadvantage. And the focus needs to be on tackling those underlying causes, whether it's adverse childhood experiences, uh, trauma, and indeed poverty and inequality. And of course, this government uh, invests around two and a half billion pounds of its budget uh, to support uh, low income uh, households. And yes, I think we you all need to conclude, accept Minister. that jail is for serious offenders who cause serious harms, but for others, prison is an expensive means of making matters worse. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. That uh, concludes the debate on a person-centred trauma-informed public health approach to substance use in the justice system. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of a business motion 3639 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau uh, setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Adam. No member has uh, asked to speak against the motion, therefore the question is that motion 3639 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The motion is there.
The next item of business is consideration of five parliamentary uh, bureau motions. I ask George Allen, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions uh, 3640 to 3643 on approval of SSIs and 3644 on designation of a lead committee. All of which move, President Officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Adam. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, uh, to which we seamlessly come now. These, there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. I remember, uh, I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Russell Finlay is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Claire Baker will fall. The first question is that amendment uh, 3625.1 in the name of Russell Finlay, which seeks to amend motion 3625 in the name of Keith Brown on a person-centred trauma-informed public health approach to substance use in the justice system is agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division and we will have to move to a vote. Uh, there will be a short suspension to allow uh, members to access the digital uh, voting system.